Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. It's weird because wasn't Chrome like supposed to be? It was supposed it, to be the best thing ever to hit the internet. It was well, it was supposed to be like it was touted as like a. a a way to reduce the amount of impact on your machine. But it's Wasn't definitely it? not. Now it's no. definitely touted as this thing sucks up all the memories. This thing sucks up all my memories. Hello. I'm here to make memories with you. My name's Nick Rome. I'm here with uh, Blake Arnsdorf today. <laughs> Making this, memories. It's uh, episode 117, and it's uh, January 21st, 2018. You're listening to... 2019. 24, 24, it's 2019. You're right. I got to change that number in our little show notes there. Uh, you're listening to, or maybe even watching, Human Factors Cast. Welcome, guys. We got a lot to talk about today. We're going to catch up with some of the news stories that happened while we were on hiatus. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that Jeff Bezos back security cam that's designed to scare criminals. Ah. We're going to improve disaster response with virtual and mixed reality. We're going to talk about some of the best and worst CES 2019 things that came out of CES 2019. And uh, we're going to take a look at Amazon's electric vest to help that human robot interaction on the floor. But first, hey, programming notes. Hey, welcome, new listeners. Uh, usually pick up a few of you after the holidays uh, as you're sitting there with your loved ones, enjoying presents by a fire. You also, you know, just key up Human Factors Cast. So welcome to the do. show. Uh, yeah, we uh, we want you to know that you can find us every noon, uh, around noon, every Tuesday Pacific time. I, I'm all over the place. You can every find us on noon. YouTube. Find us on YouTube. <laughs> You know what? We've actually been going back and uh, doing this uh, sort of backlog of our shows. So now we're making more and more of our shows available on YouTube. You can find those dropping every Wednesday and Friday, I believe, is what schedule we have. Uh, and that's just the audio only. But it's it's we're we're handpicking some of the um, some of the bonus episodes that we've done over the years um, to kind of bring that to the forefront, and then. We're going to start working backwards from 99 all the way to 1. You'll get everything. All the way all, to go. All on YouTube. Uh, yeah. So there's some events happening this year. You got never too soon to look forward to Healthcare Symposium. That's actually happening. That's next month, right? It's in March, isn't it? Two months. Yeah. Sorry. So it's, it's, it's pretty close, though. It's pretty close. Yep. Uh, may or may not have coverage on that one. We'll see. Got IEEE. We got Kai. Uh, and, of course, HFES. So we got a lot of stuff to look forward to this uh, year. So Blake, we got a little bit of UXPA Boston coming up too in twenty. Yeah, we right? do. Brian Brian did make a note on this on the Slack that uh, they just sent out a call for proposals. So Ooh. Blake, we kind of alluded to it last week. We talked a little bit of banter, but I gotta know what's going on in Blake's world. Oh man, lots of things going on in Blake's world. So you, I don't know how you feel about this because I know you don't, you haven't used this particular set of software. But I wanted to run this by you because I had a problem over the weekend of like this has got to feel like the worst, most clunky user experience ever. Hit me. So I'm a big kind of USC, UFC fight fan. There was fights over the weekend, and there's been a lot of deals going on between different companies like Fox Sports and ESPN trying to get contracts and get some of the UFC fights on their streaming services. Sure. So, cool. They finally make up their mind. They sign up with ESPN for however long, and so they're going to stream some of, the, some of the fights on the ESPN app or something like that. Okay. ESPN Plus. So tell me how ridiculous this sounds, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it makes sense. So for this weekend's fights, you had to watch the prelims. You could watch on TV, so just okay. normal television, to watch the undercards. This is the pre-stuff that happens basically right before the main event stuff. Right. You had to watch it on ESPN+. Plus, and the main card, the only way you could watch it is to go back to your TV. So you basically were having to jump between different pieces of tech. And now if you have like an, like an Xbox or you're um, you know, using something like an Apple TV, it's not as bad. But, like, you'd have to basically have cable service and then swap back and forth between that and an app to watch the entire event. Were we talking about this last week on Infinite? Just the sort of um, the model where before it used to be one package all in one. You get cable. You get everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and now, now sort of with all these streaming services, you kind of have... Well, you get this content over here, and you get that content over here, and you kind of get exclusives over here, and it, it's really kind of disjointed, and we're kind of waiting for someone to come along and say, hey, why don't we bundle all that up again? Well, to, let's figure out how to make this work. Right? I don't know. It, it's, it's, it just seems uh, – I mean, you see this across other industries, too, like with games, too. You get exclusives on certain platforms. You get, um, you know – uh, ex timed exclusives and whatnot, or or whatever. So it's it's not just with 
the TV medium, right? It or or with movies. I I don't know. It just feels very kind of disjointed to me, and uh, I don't know why we went away from that model. I think you know when there was only one sort of one. Uh, What's the analogy I'm looking for? One person out there when there was only Netflix, right? It was the only thing out there. It used to be like monopoly on the kind of stuff, and now it's like it's kind of disjointed everywhere. Everywhere, and you got to go for certain things at certain places at certain times, and it's see for the TV versus streaming model thing. I mean, obviously, I mean, I get calls from my cable provider all the time trying to get me to get cable, right? And I'm all, my my kind of answer to that every time is that I've just got streaming services and that's what I use. Like my internet service is fine. So for a model like that, I would just feel like it's, it's time to either catch up and allow people just to do that and offer the same kind of content that's not on cable or make sure that if it is something like this, where it's like a big draw in the crowd, you'd be able to access all of the things either through a streaming service or through cable, making people kind of pay for both seems a little bit silly, but I know there's a lot of money to be made by keeping cable around. Yeah. I, I just, I, I don't know, man. It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me because if you think about just from a consumer perspective, it's it's really shitty. It's like you're making me go to five places and I have to pay ten dollars here and ten dollars there and twenty dollars here. I just now I just kind of want to go back to cable. So it's all in one place. Yeah, it's it's no wonder people share their accounts between like families and stuff for stuff like HBO and Showtime and all that all that kind of jazz. It's just, it's really expensive, and then it's all over the place. Yeah. So, I don't know. But, Nick, what's been going on with you, man? It's been a week. Uh, Well, it's been a week, yes, but I did want to talk about something. So, Ooh. I got this dash cam. Um, oh, yes. And we're going to post the footage on, on YouTube so you can actually see some of the footage. Um, we live in Southern California, so it's, it's kind of um, easier for me to... I don't know, see some things that happen. I was really, really hoping that, you know, I was going to be able to see some, uh, some, some, it's always bad when people get into accidents, but you get a dash cam for two reasons, one for protection and two, so you can post the interesting things you find online. So I have three clips that I'm going to share with our, our listeners, our viewers. Uh, one of which is me in the morning. I left super early this morning and, uh, I'm on the highway and of course, there's a crash that takes up the two left lanes. Oh goodness! And I found, I found that you know, as <laughs> as I've had this dash cam, I am almost more attracted to these uh, incidents where I will drive on the side of the lane that's going to cause me more delay. Oh no! <laughs> because people are merging in, but I want to get it on camera. And I don't know if that's just because you know I, I wanted to talk about it on the show, and I've kind of had this to talk about for a while, um, but. You also I have another clip here of uh, where uh, basically somebody had mounted a curb where both sides of their tires are on either side of the curb. Oh, my goodness. And I don't know how they did it. It's just it it's impressive to see, even if it's, you know, just a uh, um, that's really intense. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. And then I the third clip I have here is, uh, uh, again, somebody just um, kind of. Oh, wait, no. The third clip I have is just somebody. Uh, weaving in and out of traffic and and you can kind of see um he's in the lane next to me in front of me he's kind of swerving in and out of traffic there you can see it's uh it, it, it was very dangerous that's always terrifying it, to when you it, see that kind of stuff it was very very dangerous so uh i do have to say though so the the one i got uh it's a garmin and it um it has amazon echo built in i'm not going to say the name because i don't want to set anybody off uh so it has that built in. So now in the car, I can have my Amazon Echo do certain things, like remind me of certain things. Like this morning, I had it set up so that way when I got in the car, 6 a.m., hey, go get gas. Oh, oh yeah, nice. I was low. That's right. Um, and then uh, you can also verbally ask it to record a video or take a picture or anything. So it's kind of hands-free. That's nice. And it's one of those dash cams that, has the really long cables. You know which one I'm talking about. Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not wireless. They're not built in. They're not on a battery. And I was kind of, uh, really, I got it as a gift. So I was kind of like, oh, no, I'm stuck with this thing. And I don't really. But I got to say, the installation process was kind of painless. And at least in most modern cars, you can hide the cable pretty well. So, oh, really? Yeah, I'll show you after this. Yeah, I'll have to I, take a look because that would be really difficult for me to do, I know. Yeah, so there's there's typically panels that hide like the uh, the airbags and, and um, you can just kind of slip the cable in there and I 
spent a lot of time making sure the cable was just right because I knew it would bother me otherwise. Uh, so it goes straight up into the roof, and then it goes around, down, and then follows the frame all oh, the way. Cool. Yeah, so you can you don't even notice it. Like passenger doesn't. Um, the cable's really long too, so you can like put the slack back in the um, back behind where all the car stuff is. Oh, there you go. You know, yeah. so anyway, yeah, I'll show you afterwards. Uh, but yeah, it's fairly easy to set up, and I was kind of pleasantly surprised. So if you're on the fence about a dash cam because you think it might be annoying to have that long cable, chances are you could probably slip it in those in between those um, panels that are on your car. And for you with that long drive that you have, having the Amazon Echo stuff kind of hooked up in there, I bet you that's pretty convenient. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I can play music anytime. Uh, the only thing that I will... Like a Rebecca Black on yeah, blast, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, you know it. Oh, goodness. Uh, so the, the I will say the only kind of uh, downer with it is that if your phone doesn't have service, then uh, Alexa won't work. But... Uh, okay. But the camera's always recording. That's good. So that's that's good. Yeah. Epic, man. Well, it's, yeah. it's cool that you've gotten some use out of it, I guess. And you were able to like install it pretty much painlessly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, look, man... It's been a while. While. You know what you know what time it is. What time is it? It's time for me to turn up the faders and hit that news. That's right. It's time for Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about anything and everything related to the field of human factors. Yeah, we're back, baby. This could be anything from medical transportation. We got some VR in there today. And design. Whatever it is, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game for Mr. Blake here and I to talk about. Blake, what do we got up first this week? Uh, lots of cool stuff, but this one comes from Jeff Bezos' back security cam that's designed to actually scare criminals and not just record them. Yeah, we're going back in time. So we're, we're taking some of these old news stories that we, we're catching up on. Oh, here we go. Hey. So installing a smart security camera is like having eyes inside your home when you're not there. But in reality, these devices don't do that much. They might send you a notification if it detects movement, but in all likelihood, it could just be your cat wandering through the kitchen. But if there's a burglary underway, it'll be seen, you can see it on your camera, only on an app that you're using, and then you yourself are likely going to have to report it to the police, so now you're only catching somebody in the act. Now, Deep Sentinel, Jeff Bezos' back security company, is changing that by selling a smart security system that uses computer vision to identify whether detective movement is just a mailman dropping off a package or a bona fide thief trying to sneak through the side door. If the camera's AI hub determines that something is amiss, a red LED ring around the device, the device's speaker will light up, and the camera feed will stream live to a deep signal security agent, which can scare the criminal away through the loudspeaker and then, of course, call the police. Actually, the interesting part about this is the entire system is designed to deter, deter criminals through its actual aesthetic design, so they... Uh, Deep Sentinel hired a design firm called Ammunition to create an industrial design that serves two very different functions. So for the homeowner, you want the device to be easy to use, but also with the criminal in mind, you're hoping that the appearance alone scares people away because this thing's pretty big, black, has a red dot around it. Uh, but this is kind of an interesting take for Amazon design-wise, right? Because it's def it's kind of going in the opposite direction of their typical designs, right, Nick? Yeah, this isn't this isn't Amazon, right? This is Deep Sentinel. This is Deep um, Sentinel, that's for which sure. is backed by Jeff Bezos, which is Amazon's daddy. Um, so <laughs> Amazon's daddy. Amazon's daddy. Uh, so yeah, I this I actually really like this story. This is really cool because um, for a variety of reasons. Well, one, they. They're taking this thing called design, which we do. We do human factors, and they are human factoring the shit out of this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, nice they really Martian did. reference. But yeah, yeah, they did. So they took not only uh, the user in mind, but they also kind of looked and said, "How can we scare the shit out of somebody who's doing something wrong?" Precisely. Um, to the point where they are connecting somebody with a somebody who's monitoring this, and that person is able to talk to them and scare them. Like that's cool. Well, it's awesome because they created a cool design because, in my opinion, it looks cool. It looks kind of terrifying. It does, like, give out that industrial vibe, and it, it would look scary if you kind of even were the mailman and saw the thing because uh, it's all black. It has, like, a red ring around it. You can see it on YouTube, but for those of you just listening. Um, why why would you be scared if it was the mailman? Because if you were the mailman, because you would just, you're just if, doing If your I job. had never seen that before, I would be terrified if I was the mailman. Do you think it's a gun? I would think it would. there would something going on. 
going to shoot lasers at you or you're something. Just, you're just doing your job. You're just dropping off packages. Yeah, I, but if I hadn't seen a camera like that before, because you'd be more used to like what a nest looks like on the outside, sure. what some of the other security cameras look like on the outside, but this thing is pretty terrifying looking. I don't know. Has this hit the market yet? Uh, Yeah. They've yeah. at least like got it out for sale, and you can like get the sur- subscription service, which also covers your security agent in this case. Sure, yeah. I I don't know. I I think after a while you'd pick up on what these things look like, but um, so yeah, maybe the first time. But I I still think that this is uh this is pretty cool because you know it'll stop it'll definitely stop a package thief or two. Oh yeah, I'm sure it would, especially because they've now tied in smartly a service that has a live human that can like tap into the feed if an AI hub detects that okay, in fact this is some odd movement that's not normal. Have you seen some of those uh, videos of the nest with the package like with the um not package thieves but with the mailmen that drop off the package? No. Oh, uh, there I saw one the other day. It was pretty wholesome. This guy was like, "Hey, uh, I I got a package from your uncle." Um, it says Uncle Ronnie or whatever on it, and uh, I I know that you know there's not typically like insurance on these like there is for Amazon packages or whatever. Is there anywhere you want me to leave it? And she's like, No, no, no. You can just drop it on the uh, doorstep. And he's like, I don't really feel comfortable doing that. Can I, is it okay if I just put it in this trash can right here and you can just grab it when you get home? And she's like, Yeah, that's fine. That's he pretty was cool. Really looking out for the person that um you know he was delivering to, which I thought was really cool. That is awesome because that it's happens awesome. more often than I ever thought. Like I've had some packages swiped off my apartment doorstep, and I live like two still two stairways up. So I don't know. It's You've had packages stolen? Yeah. What yeah. were they? Were they like anything valuable? Uh, yeah, actually. Elise, friend of the show, and my significant other, she had um, like a bunch of pretty expensive kind of like workout clothes and equipment stolen off the front porch. And luckily, like the company replaced it, no problem. Right, but um, but if you get something from a family member, that's harder to replace. Oh yeah, yeah, it's so. it's a bummer. Yeah, so so it's it's one of those things that it might even be worth us investing in some kind of camera system. Yeah, you need one of these. Um, yeah, anything that will yell at people, that'd be yeah. hilarious. Get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> so I would fall down the steps and then sue me for the camera yelling at them. Yeah, but I, I really like this all the way down to the design of like the color used red, right? That's scary. That means, hey, I'm recording. Hey, that your bad is detected, right? Red, red is dead. Like there's a bunch of different connotations with the color red. I mean, we can go on and on. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it's cool. That's cool. I, I really like this a whole lot. Yeah, I would, love, I would love to have known a little bit more about how like – because it's pretty small design, so I mean, think about that. This thing is analyzing, or I guess it has a hub inside, or whatever that's analyzing most of the stuff. That sure, the yeah. Is the processing done on locally, or is it done in the cloud? Uh, that is a great question. I know I they get a the hub that a lot of it's done on inside to kind of run everything centrally, but I'm sure it's done in a cloud service. I mean, yeah. this is Amazon. Back. It has to be. Yeah, it has to be. It's probably AWS. A. W-S. All right, what do we got up next? All right, so we're improving disaster response with virtual reality and mixed reality. So virtual and mixed reality, MR and VR, respectively, are giving city planners and first responders a number of tools to help save lives when it comes to natural and man-made disaster events. On the planning side, generating virtual environments complete with detailed characters may sound like playing SimCity in the early 2000s, but when combined with large-scale real-world data, 3D model creating algorithms in VR, disaster scenarios can be simulated for cities with increasing accuracy. So when it comes to executing that plan, unmanned vehicles can be ideal for search and rescue missions, and drones excel in this capacity because they can move quickly and relay video back to their operators. However, controlling them once they're out of sight can be challenging and researchers in Austria are, are using MR so mix is it, yeah mixed reality to help solve solve this problem as IEEE Spectrum has reported so while these two technologies are still in the research phase and it may seem far off this technology is helping with suburban simulations right now so in about 5 to 10 years in new city expansion and improvement will largely be reflected in the digital world first and this virtual proving ground stands to improve the lives of all city residents. So this is another great example of just taking technology, mapping it to what data you have available, what you've been collecting, and then thinking of progressive ways that you could continue to collect, you know, meaningful data for people to use from drones or from even like smart city technology. Yeah, I think uh, there's there's this cool thing that they mentioned at the end of the the blurb here so this is from ieee but they mentioned that this is being used now in um 
you know, they're using this as a practical solution now as, as this urban simulation planning um, for, well, urban simulation. They're using it for that. And if you think about five to 10 years from now, this is going to be like a central part. They can kind of use these uh, VR models to see how people might interact with a, the way a, a, a city is planned out or something like that. Or even restructuring a current city, right? I mean, I could see how something like this could save you a lot of money in terms of like planning or how you lay out sure. things and taking into account, you know, existing, you know, buildings where people go, that kind of stuff. So it's a lot of awesome technology being built in. And it looks like you've got a little bit about the Microsoft HoloLens in here. Yeah, I, this is uh, just a little bit of how kind of they control drones, right? So at, at least... Yeah, they so what they do is they put on this HoloLens, and by using your face, you can sort of reposition the drone to give you kind of a proper view when you turn your head in a different direction, um, and that kind of gives you the sense of having X-ray vision in the city, right? So you can kind of look in a different direction and then see through, right? You can effectively look through walls and separate you and the drone, making it um, sort of a potential a potential asset when you're trying to save lives in these environments. Wow. That's that's awesome to see such a combination of the two technologies coming together. Yeah. I mean, just think about so so to, to draw the picture again. So you have this hollow lens on. There's a building in front of you. And then there's a drone beyond that with a camera. Sure. And so the drone feed is then fed to you in your hollow lens and you are seeing what's on the other side of that building. Gotcha. Or uh, you know, uh, probably a, a better scenario where, you know, you're not looking far off in the distance, um, looking beyond a wall. You send a drone into a burning building and um, you then tap into that feed. And as you move your head, the drone moves. So that way you can kind of see through that wall. That's interesting. Cause Isn't I mean, that neat? Yeah. Thinking about like a drone being in, in a situation like that, either a bur- burning building, something that's collapsing, whatever it may be. If you're able to like swivel the drone with your head, does that mean they're, there's got to be some other operator moving it for you. What, the drone? Yeah. It's all AI. Just AI-based? I would imagine. Gracious. That is the control, right? You move it, and it moves in that direction um, where AI kind of takes care of whatever obstacles, right? It moves so that way you can see what's through it. Interesting. Yikes. Um, there's also been research published on IEEE that proposes a similar concept where sort of an engineer or artifact can teleoperate a Walkman robot. Um, using a VR device and a body tracking system. So this is like literally hop into your mech and then walk the robot in uh, to investigate buildings that might collapse, right? Which is an awesome concept. So, and it's surprising yeah. that it's taken this long to really get something out there like that. Yeah, but I mean, that's cool. You're literally controlling a robot with your body. So that way you can move into this. Uh, I'm doing the robot right now. You, you move into this building that's potentially dangerous and you're able to save lives. Uh, it, potentially with even more power than you might have as a human being, right? Robots and actuators and mechanical and everything. You might be able to lift somebody up with a lot more ease, right? Where for you, it's just a simple arm movement. And for the robot, they're they're the ones doing all the work. Yeah, um, and now you're not carrying a whole bunch of equipment through a burning building or one that's, like, collapsing or anything like yeah, that. So that's yeah, amazing. So it's, it's not only safer for the firefighter, but it might actually help save the life of the other person on the other end that's being saved because the firefighter's not going to, you know, get out of breath or um, they're not going to be impeded by the actual fire. They're just going to do their job and get you out of there. Yeah, and somebody didn't realize a lot of time because my stepdad was a firefighter for a long time and something he always used to talk about is like just faulty equipment and you'd be on the job, find out, and you just have to deal with it. There's nothing you could really do. So something like this where it's like a robotic system, it's less of a danger to like the actual human right? versus like the other instance where you have to worry about the equipment that doesn't work. Do you know if they have like regular scheduled checks maintenance? I'm sure they did. They did, but it, even still you'd go out like on short notice or somebody would forget something. There was right. all sorts of problems that could happen on the fly. Right? Government could shut down. Oh, well, and there's that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I got, I got a lot of banter to talk about when we get to our, uh, oh, geez. yeah. When we get to infinite tonight, man, I am talking about my flight. Cause that was fun. <laughs> All right, well, we are going to be back with some more news stories, and we'll be back to break it down right after this little guy. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener-supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon. 
now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. That was a transition I do. I wasn't even trying to do. I said infinite tonight in the banter. So good. And then we did the infinite commercial. Yep. That was nice. Yeah. You're the man. Come Thanks. Through. Uh, yeah. So before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at, uh, oh, that's wrong. IEEE, TechCrunch, and Fast Company. And we have one more probably. I don't know. Those are the three. Uh, thank you for all of our news stories this week. Uh, if you want to follow along, you can follow us on social media or join Slack because Mateo is always posting our news stories in there. Crushing he is, it. Yeah, we are we are uh, indebted to Mateo for taking some of these stories from him this week. He's always finding good stuff, so so do go check us out on Slack. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? Up next, Nick, is the best of CES 2019. So Monsters displays VR in cars and crazy personal gadgets. So unbelievably, it's already come and gone, but we're here to break down some of the best for Human Factors. Cast. I think this is the first time we actually like missed CES on the show. Which is like, horrifying, because that's one of the f- my favorite parts. But I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie, this one is a little bit lackluster. lackluster. Wow! Whoa, Jinx, we did it, coat, bro. man. All right, yeah. okay, we did it. So, okay, let's look through these things. Um, I guess we can uh, kind of pick out anything that's fun. Uh, this story is by courtesy of TechCrunch and all the subsequent articles as well. Yes, indeed. Um, okay, I'm going to pull out this first one because I was really intrigued by this. So, there's this thing. Uh, I'm not sure what it's called. What is it? It's uh, Audi's new electric SUV e-tron. Um, they basically put you in an Oculus Go headset wired up to the car, um, and uh, you get Rocket from from Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> and uh, you have to help him and Iron Man defeat some of Thanos' baddies before shooting them down while you fly through space, and you went off on the game and on the track, and it felt like a this. Uh, let's see here. This is uh, who is this that wrote this? Matt Burns describes it as um, being just like a ride at Disney World. In a car. That's so fun. Isn't that cool? That'd be so fun. <laughs> Especially in an Audi. I know, Just right? Cruising. So let's see here. On this Rockets is Adventure. I'm trying to think of like what interesting things we can pull out of this other than this is a car with VR in it. And now uh, I guess it's like a game. So as you turn one direction or the other, the car, the VR environment would do the same. Um man, I just don't know I don't know where to go with this other than this is pretty cool. And uh, some of these screenshots look really neat i think the reason why matt here didn't experience any motion sickness is because the car is moving um with the sort of uh with the car or the wait, the car is moving with the car of course it is the vr is moving with the car yeah i think that makes a lot of sense too <laughs> could you imagine yeah. this being the future of how we ride around in cars though like, it, like a, if you in autonomous vehicles, if you're on some sort of set path, right, and you know what traffic looks like, and you can expect certain things, and then you can and just then start the, adjusting based yeah. on just like an algorithm in the back. Yeah, you're no just kidding. hanging out playing VR, you know, hanging out with Rocket and Iron Man, just cruising. Yeah, no kidding. That'd be that'd be really neat. Um, so what what's up? What do you want to pick out of this list, Nick? I I don't know if I want to pick this out of the list, but I think I'm getting left out by not having an Amazon personal assistant i don't know what sets it off Uh, alexa okay so alexa play human factors cast oh goodness there it is because they apparently they're putting alexa in everything from toilets from kohler this year but what was interesting to me is sony actually alexa flush my poop oh goodness that's (laughs) terrifying why why would you want to talk to alexa while you're in the bathroom okay okay look i can think of two or three use cases got it all right what do you got okay alexa flush that might be one. Okay. Yeah. All right. You don't want to use your hands. No your, more hands. Look, like, like, let's say, okay, let's say this is in a public restroom, right? Oh, and that's a different story. Yeah. It gets real gross. You don't want to touch it with your hands. Alexa, flush. Not a bad idea. Okay. That's use case one. Boom. Use case two. What do you do when you are on the toilet, Blake? Just chain hang, man. You look up stuff on the internet and you're doing other things and usually like either Instagramming or reading stories. One right. Of the two. What if you think of something while you're on the toilet? I oh, type hey. it into Google Notes. Uh, Alexa, add this to my to-do list. Ah, there you go. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, hey, number three. What if you remember something to do later? Uh, hey, Alexa, set a reminder for this thing. Alexa. I guess I already do that now. Like, even if I have my phone in my pocket, I'll do the same thing with Siri. Right. So, or play music. I, w- I want to blast tunes. Which, wa- by the way, this special toilet with Alexa is outfitted with surround sound and lights to make <sighs> you feel like you're having a tranquil experience. Look at that. Bangers. Play, play, uh, play uh, brook noises or river noises. Or <laughs> brook noises? <laughs> I had a... I had a Play, uh, play a babbling brook, please. Yeah, babbling brook. That helps me so, get so, down. So everything's getting outfitted with these toilets. You go on. Yeah, toilets. In, but what seemed kind of fun to me was Sony's ca- Sony's noise canceling headphones having access to something like like Alexa. Because same thing. Like sometimes I, whenever I'm working, I'll take my phone and I'll go put it in a completely different room. Um, and I'm not always great about going back and checking like text notes that I've left myself or even handwritten notes. So sure. having something you could set reminders from or like order stuff that you need yeah. directly would be kind of fun. The thing I like about it is that it will um, it will actually push out to you notifications if you set reminders. Mm. So that way, like, you know, every Monday morning before I leave for work, it'll say, hey, remember your laptop today, you're podcasting. Um, so That's it's kind of nice for things like that, like recurring, like, Let's say you want to do your laundry every Sunday night so at like 4 p.m. It'll say, hey, start doing your laundry now if you want to go to bed in a reasonable time. Like, yeah. you, know, you can do those things. You can set up recurring ar- reminders. So uh, I, I really like them. Um, um, obviously, there's frustration when other members of the family uh, have frustration with her. Say, turn off the lights, and she starts playing Taylor Swift, shake turn it off. off the like, lights. What? Oh. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. It, I don't know how that is draws it that voice recognizing. Does it like know that it's you versus somebody else? It should be in theory. I don't think I've trained it uh, to do that. But interesting. Yeah, I wonder if it would res- respond better to uh, her if if she actually trained it. Um, yeah, I would have to say this is pretty lackluster. The other things on this list are like a, a f- five thousand dollars sixty five inch gaming display. Okay, the monster. Um, it seems like technology just keeps getting bigger and better and whatever okay I, I kind of expect that it's the weird stuff that i like from ces um isn't is it i triple or ces it does like the weekly weird oh uh, that's i triple e yeah that'll that's exciting i'll be stoked for that because yeah i'm not really seeing a whole lot else i mean i would love to have a giant 5k oh how about the pop socket that's in the iphone case oh yeah yeah don't no. get me wrong i'd love to have that thing i just don't find it t- particularly interesting no, um, it's cool that it's in an otter box, I guess, because I like those cases because you can, you know, run over with your car and you'll still be fine. And now you can pop it out and put it in your hand. But I just don't I don't see a whole lot in here that's that cool. And then they got this weird, disappointing email. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. But I, I, I will say there has been some criticism about CES this year. Uh, from, has there? For not including, like, sex tech. Um, because what? sex tech is a big market and there's always advances being made in... Um, in that whole tech domain. Um, and in fact, they revoked an award from a female founded sex tech company for something today or this year. Um, did just for being from the company, I think. What? Uh, let's see here. It's a hands-free device. If you got young ones in the car, sorry, I've already cussed a couple times, but this might get uh, a little steamy here. Oh, it, was, it looks like it was a mistake. Oh, like they just, they gave an award away. They weren't supposed to give away. Oh, Great. Oh, yeah, no. I just uh, there was there was some criticism about it. Um, yeah, it's not as highly because I remember in years past it's been kind of really showcased, especially like through TechCrunch's you know reviews of things. Yeah, uh, so I don't know. there's a podcast by TechCrunch that goes into the sex tech fail. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely seems like uh, they're they're not doing that great on that front. So. I don't know. It's always those are those are fun things to talk about too. They are because they're controversial, and sometimes we can get silly about it. But this time they gave us a lack of sex talk things to talk about, sex tech things to talk about. Yeah, no one, no one wants to hear us talk about sex more than our listeners, than tech nerds, than yeah. our yeah. Yeah. <laughs> human factors practitioners. And we um, appreciate every talk, last one of you. Talk about usability. Thank you for sticking <laughs> with us, people. Um, all right, Blake, we got what, one more story here. Yep, we got one more. Let's we'll, get into it. We'll keep it clean. So Amazon built an electric vest to improve worker-robot interactions. 
So over the course of the last year, Amazon has rolled out new worker safety wearables to over 25 sites, and one of which is this robot tech vest that's really more like a pair of suspenders attached to an electronic utility belt. The Amazon Robotics Design product was created to keep workers safe when they need to enter a space in order to fix a robotic system or retrieve fallen items. Built-in sensors alert Amazon's robotic system to the wearer's presence, and they slow down. then they can slow down to avoid any kind of collision. The vest is designed to work in tandem with the robot's existing obstacle avoidance detection systems. And what the vest allows robots to do is to detect the human from farther away and smartly update its travel plans to either steer clear without needing to associate with the person or explicitly mark those as out of, out of bounds zones. So safety, of course, has been a major concern when it comes to dealing with human-robotic interactions at, at and in the workplace, and it makes sense that Amazon is on the forefront of taking care of some of this. Nick, the video for this is pretty in- intense, just looking at the robots themselves that are kind of rolling around. Yeah, okay. I'm, did you mention this? I'm sorry, I kind of zoned out there. Did you mention this bear repellent incident? No. Okay, so in December, two dozen, how, that's 24 Amazon employees, were sent to the hospital in a bear repellent re- related incident. Uh oh. Did the robot let off bear repellent? In which a robot may have been involved. Oh no. <laughs> Hence the need for some security changes. Yeah, you know, you know, a lot of these big technology pushes are because of incidents that happen, which makes um, sense. You like something the, goes wrong, you need some a tech gap to fill it. Yeah, especially yeah. like in the military or aviation or sure. or uh, maritime. All these domains have some sort of major push behind them. Like, let's not make this happen again because that was bad. Um, bear repellent incident. I, I'm going to look. Bear repellent hang on. is Amazon moving. <laughs> I am curious now. I'm actually going to search bear repellent on Amazon. <laughs> just to, just so somebody has to interact with it. Yeah. So this, uh, all right, all right. There is a fair amount of different There's, types of bear repellents, yeah, apparently. Look at that. I bet you it was not the horn. I bet it was the pepper gel yeah. that oh, kind of exploded or that's something. That's no good. A robot yeah. run over it and blow it all over the place. Is there like a, is this a grenade? It looks like it. Chest or belt holster. All right. Is this a. I think it's a spray, though. Yeah, You're it might to unholster be. unholster it, unclip the thing all before the bear mauls you in the face. Yeah, apparently. But, I mean, it would, wouldn't would it make more sense if it was just like a grenade? You could throw it at the thing and then... I guess, but I don't know. Because you would have this thing long out before. I don't know. If there's any hunters that listen to the show, let us know. Cause I, or, uh, or people, campers. I don't know. People that have encountered bears and People that have encountered bears. There was a video on Reddit. This is going to be a slight off the rails. There was a video on Reddit the other day. Uh, of this guy in a tent and he like pokes his phone up and there's a bear like less than five feet away from him like going through his stuff and i'm just like dude this guy has got guts like i would be so still on the floor of that tent not moving a muscle and he's up there filming the damn thing like it's not a good look i'm glad you survived that's insane yeah um bears and reddit but it, <sighs> but so this system looks like it's it's pretty interesting. It's just it basically like the article describes. It's a it's like a suspenders utility belt system that helps you. I guess you're just transmitting to the robot like, hey, I'm about to enter into the space. I don't know if you have to actually make anything happen or do anything specific more than just walk into the zone that the robot's going to be in. But then it can adjust its you know travel path or explicitly if you're going to be in a specific area, maybe fixing another robot. You could just mark it as an out of bound zone, so the robot just doesn't even. Other robots in the area don't even come near you at the time. So it's an awesome design, and I'm, I'm sure that this bear incident was like, oh my goodness, that is a giant grizzly. Yeah, uh, or is that just a brown bear? Either way, that's terrifying. That's like five feet away from his, his 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 uh, little tent. Look, and you can see he's in his tent Mom. filming this thing. And the bears Crazy. just eating grass outside. Yeah, is there I, berries outside or something? I don't know. I guess I, I should be post so this too. Terrified because that yeah. thing would eat your face. All right, it's on YouTube. You guys can see it. Um, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I, technology I, won't save you there. No, it won't. But anyway, so the <laughs> yeah, that's definitely. Um, sorry, I just realized we made a slight error. That's okay. Uh, but yeah, th- I think the um, I think the vest is a great idea, especially so that way. Uh, the robots won't have to. Um, they they won't interfere with what the human is doing, and I think this is a good solution for sort of retrofitting technology that already exists. They, Amazon already has 
these robots that walk around or I guess roll around the floor like giant Roombas right and they're on their own paths and this is one way to kind of retrofit that technology because uh, on one hand I was like well why don't they just outfit the robots with you know something that can better sensors see, or something see humans yeah. but then it's like well that technology is already built so the next best thing is to outfit the human with some repellent <laughs> so <laughs> Got him. But some repellent that that then uh, pushes the uh, passively pushes the robots away from them, so that way they don't interfere with what they're doing. Bear repellent for robots, brought to you by Amazon. Yep, it's it's kind of cool too because I mean it's it's obviously smart on their part because they're you don't have to stop production if one robot goes down. You can afford to have somebody go into the area wherever the robots are, and not worry about bear repellent or any kind of other absurd accidents happening. So that's cool. Yeah, I agree. I. Uh, I don't know. I don't have much more to say about this story other than I hope no more bell, bear repellent actions uh, accidents happen. Yeah, that's that's terrifying. I would not want wish that upon anybody, robot or human. Yep. Nope. Uh, wow. There's that bear again. That's so scary. Yeah, it is. <laughs> hey, you know what? It's been like a good month since we've checked in with Reddit. It has. It's been a, a few times. It's it's been a bit. It came from. It came from. As I so clearly stall to find the button that I'm not used to pressing anymore because we were off the, sh- off the air for a month. It's uh, good. Yeah, it's, this is It Came From Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. Any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and dis- encourages discussion among the community. Uh, Blake, I understand we have a video of a bear outside a tent first up. Yep, we do. <laughs> all right. No, what do we got? Uh, what, so do we, what do we want to do? We've One? got a fair amount. How many do we have time for? Eh, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, let's let's do like two or three. Okay, so we got a couple options. Let's go with the first one and see how we tackle it. All right. Where is the first one? I lost my place. There it is. Okay. So this is from the user experience subreddit by Creative Requirement. Um, you've taken over an application designed by a developer. How do you go about familiarizing yourself with the product, and what documentation do you create so that you can ma- start making UX decisions ASAP? This is a great question. Thank you for pulling this one, Blake. <laughs> ah, you did good this week. Yeah, cool. you did. Yeah. We're one for one so far. Epic. All right. What, what do you think? Do you want to go and do his thing, or we just we can just answer the question from here, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, you. Oh, that's the title, and then the actual. Okay. They, yeah, he's got, he wrote oh, us wow. a letter. He wrote us a letter. Hey, fellow UXers, I've recently realized I don't have a good process for getting up to speed with an existing app. In my previous jobs, I was often lucky enough to be around from the beginning on the product. In my new role, I take on a totally new apps with zero documentation every six months or so. And to be able to sit alongside the devs who have been working on them already and make confident, informed suggestions. That's interesting. I also often need to hand off the apps, so having a document or something to help everyone on the team visualize flows in the app is key. The solution I've arrived at for now is screenshotting different processes within the app and keeping them in a sort of mind map file to visualize flows, but it's easy to miss edge cases this way, and it's time-consuming. I'd love to hear any tips or advice that comes to mind. What processes would you use? I've been Googling around myself, and will toss a comment up if I find anything promising. So, Blake, how do you do it? Dude and or dude Ed, you are in a tough situation, it sounds like, because you're consistently, obviously you're excelling at it if you're doing it over and over, but it sounds like in your role you're consistently getting into the situation where there's already been an app de- developed and designed by a developer, and you're coming in kind of after the fact to help them figure out what they can do to make any kind of like informed suggestions about the overall flow of the, of the application itself. So if I was you, I would try as hard as I could, depending on what your job description is or whatever the process they typically use is, but I would try and get further to the left of the design before any like kind of development starts happening, like trying to understand at the forefront what really needs to be done, what's the goal of the application, what tasks do users be, need to be able to create or be able to accomplish. Because one thing that you might be able to avoid then is missing out on some of these edge cases. Because if you're able to brainstorm with like a product developer or your team manager plus maybe another UX person or just the three of you, maybe you can get a better sense of really where the gaps might be uh, before you even start the development process. But in terms of what you do now, I mean, the best thing you could do is talk to the developer, in my opinion. 
Um, and if you know any kind of code and depending on like what applications are built in, you can read some of their developer documentation, which I'd be surprised if there's none of it. I know you say there is zero documentation. Uh, sometimes developer documentations help me out in understanding what people are doing. Um, and then in, in terms of if you're visualizing, just visualizing flows, I mean, something I've had a great success with and handing off to the developers is using like some, a program like Draw.io. Um, oh, yeah. And then also, too, just creating like basic UI kits or some people call them style guides. There's a lot of different names for them, but things that you can actionably say like these interactions and design patterns are what I think we should use in specific instances. So it's easy to kind of pick up or easy for a developer to pick up and kind of apply to their design. Uh, but Nick, what do you got? This is tricky because I have had this experience where you come in on a project that's half, you know, halfway through and you're yeah. just trying to get up to speed on it. Um, before you make any informed decisions. And I think there's a couple key things that you bring up here. Um, creative requirement. The uh, I like that name. Uh, so, look, there's there's a couple things here. Blake, you mentioned edge cases. I wouldn't worry about edge cases. Honestly, they are edge cases for a reason. They don't happen very often. Um, and, you know, potentially focus on the bulk of what's going to happen. If you have to sort of say, do away with this, with the 10% of time that things happen, at least you're solving for the 90% of the time. And that will help more people than focusing on that 10% of edge cases. Definitely. Uh, second off, if, if what I'm understanding is correct, it sounds like you're working on something and then you hand it off and then something else comes in. So you don't really have time to get to the left. If that's the case, do the best you can. I mean, uh, you, you talk about these flows, and I think workflows are a good way to kind of understand what is there and what is missing uh, from the operator's perspective, whatever whoever your user is. I think there's one additional thing that you can do is kind of set up, use heuristic evaluation for yourself. If you're trying to look for quick and dirty, you know these things as a UX folk. Um, you know how to do a heuristic evaluation, and you know kind of what general generalities there are that are do's and don'ts and so by just tackling that first and saying hey look it didn't pass my scorecard fix these things and also i noticed that there's a couple missing steps in this workflow that you're expecting the user to do i think that is for what you're uh trying to do here the best you're gonna get without more time yeah because it sounds like it's quick turnarounds i mean six months is not a lot of time to make a huge impact no, but you can definitely start with a uh, with a task flow and a heuristic evaluation, and that will get you uh, that'll get you pretty good. Yeah, let you hit the ground running for sure. Yeah, that's two projects a year. Woo! All right, which one do you want to do next? Ooh. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about human factors because we hardly get any human factors subreddits. Oh, is this from two hundred nine Sage? Yep, two hundred nine Sage coming at you hot on the Human Factors subreddit. So this is online coursework related to human factors. Hi, all. I just discovered human factors and what this area of study entails. I'm looking to bring some of this knowledge into my workspace in the medical industry. Oh, great! It's it's ripe for that. Woo. Uh, I recognize that a lot of the questions slash topics I've already been contemplating fall under the umbrella of human factors. For those that have gone through the academic programs, are there any online courses you would recommend? That might be content equivalent. I would really appreciate any source resources you could provide. I hope to slowly transition into a related role as I'm already in industry. I'm hoping I can start with potential projects uh, around me rather than leaving and entering academia, although I do realize this might be a requirement long term. Perhaps you could also comment on this strategy as well. Blake. Loving it. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one. Right, because there's you can always go for human factors related course content. That's a little bit harder, but becoming either like a member of either HFES or any kind of other human factors related uh, society can get you access to some kind of more information about like human factors and at least get you kind of tied into what's going on in the research world. Uh, so that's always a great help. Looking into you know different kind of methodologies you might find a little bit more about ux that'll help you method wise I've, I've never really seen too many online things for human factors methods but there's bound to be some um one thing that i think is super important is if you're trying to enter in the medical space i know the fda has very specific guidelines related to both the types of evaluations so both summative and formative evaluations for kind of uh medical devices and any kind of product that you're going to have at point of care 
Um, so that's a good place to start because that's that's guidance written for a human factors practitioner with you in mind if you're looking to test any kind of medical devices or kind of interact with any processes within a hospital. Uh, so that's a good way to go. Also, too, I'm hoping that maybe if you're already in the medical industry, you may have had the opportunity to interact with other human factors practitioners practitioners or people that work within your company. So they're always a great resource. Having somebody that actually has had the experience working in the field is a great resource to you if just to talk to. Um, another way to get more information about just HF related content uh, is to go to conferences. So, so we got one coming up that's kind of just for you uh, and people of the like. And that is, what is that? The Healthcare up? Symposium. Healthcare Symposium 2019 in March. So that's a great, that great out. place to really get a sense of what's going on both in the medical community, which sounds like you already have a good grasp of, but also what's going on in human factor science, how it's impacting medical devices and medical stuff in general or the medical industry in general. Yeah. Um, yeah, Nick. Wow. Uh, okay. So this one, they're looking for an online solution for human factors and, um, without going back to academia, it looks like. Yeah. So, I don't know. I okay. I don't want to sound like a jerk. <laughs> I don't want to sound like a jerk, Blake. Ooh. Don't make me sound like a jerk. Um, there's. <laughs> oh no! 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 What are you gonna say? Come on! No! No! It'll no! There's fine. a website called Google. Use it. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, burn! <laughs> no. Okay. So, like, look. There's. I, I think what this person is asking is for specific recommendations because anyone can jump on Google and look for online programs that uh, tailor to human factors, and I think. A lot of it is uh, if you are truly interested in human factors, you're going to have to do a lot of research. And, you know, I'm not saying you don't do that now, but really, I think um, the answers are out there online already. And I don't want to speak to specific programs. I don't want to come off like a shill for some. I'm not even going to mention my alma mater. Uh, I think for you, find the best option for you um, and reach out to others that you have that you've made connections with about specific programs. If you want to find out about, you know, online programs, uh, Blake always, you know, recommends starting a meetup and I'm sure you could find people, especially at HFES. Hey, go to HFES, ask people who are there, um, you know, what they think of the online programs that they're in and get feedback firsthand and that that might help tailor your recommendation and it is all about who you know so if you go to hfes you know it's a double-edged sword so you can uh you can go and you can find out information about your programs and you can also make those connections and you can also find you can look for depending on what city you're in and like if you're located in a metropolitan area or where one of these groups is but you can look for specifically an hfes chapter in your city that's true, too. Yeah, San Diego so, has one for sure. That's a great place to start. Um, also, I would say, um, you know, if you're not trying to get back into academia, you're not going to have a whole lot of options for human factors. I think human factors is a little bit more scientific in nature. If you're looking for something similar to human factors, UX might be able to get you there because I know a lot of boot camps happen. Um, I know there is, like, specific training modules that are not really academic in nature but they're more focused on the methods that you might use as a ux professional so that might also be something you want to look into as an alternative um that's just my two cents again i don't want to sound like a jerk but uh google is your best friend when it comes to searching those things (laughs) one free one or freebie one we were talking about heuristic evaluations earlier you can always check out the Nielsen Norman group. They have a lot of information. They've kind of transitioned between like being very human factors focused to like moving into the buzzword wor- word world of UX. So they kind of teeter on both sides, but that's a good resource for you to look up. Like what is a heuristic evaluation? What are some of the methods that are used in human factors? Um, good place to start. Sure. Yeah. And there's, there's tons of books out there too. All right. Science. Uh, let's, let's hit another one here. You what do you want? Do one more? Accessibility or Stanford Prison Research? <laughs> oh man, I can't remember what that study is. So let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about accessibility. Because now I'm going to warn you, I don't necessarily have a good answer to this. This All is right. more of like a discussion piece. This is on the user experience subreddit. Uh-oh. Uh oh. This is by Garciallo. Um, I wonder if I know who that is. Uh, do, How you, do you know these Reddit people? Oh, you know, I spend a lot of time on Reddit. How do you include it in your process? Talking about accessibility. Accessibility SME here was wondering how a SME is a subject matter expert for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term. I thought it was, was, wa- 
was wondering how and how much UX generalists around here include in accessibility in their work. If not much, what is preventing you from making your products usable by people with disabilities? That's a good question. Blake, you and I don't really do much of that because we design for a very specific demographic. Yes, precisely. Um, and, but it's something that I haven't thought about in my work in a long time. I mean, even when I'm building websites outside of my kind of day-to-day job, like accessibility kind of gets thrown around a lot, right? Like there's accessible things you can do in your code to make it much more easy for somebody with like a visual disability to use. Sure. Color blindness. Um, color blindness or even somebody that's blind, right? So including Increase specific the text. Ta- yeah, yeah inc- including like specific text fields and things like that that are more normative for a screen reader. But, Meta tags. But I think a lot of it has to do with the, in our line of work anyway, is we're not targeting a domain that's outside of a very specific type of person. Right. Uh, with a really specific role that you're not going to be able to do the job unless you can meet these criteria. Yeah, and and it's weird because I don't want to say all of usability is accessibility, right? Because what I'm trying to say is that you are ultimately designing for this thing to be more accessible to people uh, than it would have been otherwise. Um, talking about accessibility in this in this type of uh, sort of uh, context is is sort of taking that a step further and saying, okay, well there are those edge cases that we talked about earlier. There are are people who cannot access this content. How do we also include them so they can access this content too? Um, you know, and the, like with the edge cases on a, on a heuristic evaluation, that's one thing because whatever, but this is actual people that you're talking about that are not going to be able to use your product. Um, and so, yeah, it's important to think about, I don't have an answer to that. I don't think about it. Um, only because we do design for that very specific demographic. Yeah, and I think a lot of, for the domain we work in as well, a lot of the accessibility, quote unquote, has always been taken care of by anthropomorphic data, right? So right. making sure that you're meeting that median person type yeah. of thing. I, I will say, you know, work has been done um, to kind of make things more accessible to people by providing them other input methodology. Like, let's say you're an amputee and you don't have an arm or you don't have a arm, hand, whatever, some control mechanism. Um, companies like Microsoft put out their uh, controller in which they have all these different accessories that you can plug into it and control it how you want. The game operates the same, but you can use that controller however is comfortable for you. So so in a way, it's like a blanket accessibility, although the design of the software isn't specifically targeted to those individuals. There is hardware out there that adapts it for that software, which is good. Um, it's just, it's, yeah, it's hard to think about accessibility from the software side of things. It can be. I think a lot of the saving grace of why a lot of websites have had to deal with this or think about it much more, especially if you're going to like a public product and things like that is that there's compliance regulations for it, for government entities and all that kind of stuff. So it is out there in the zeitgeist to think about. Um, and I think it's somewhat something that a lot of people should pay attention to. Um, but again, I think it's going to depend on what if there is a, speci- a very specific niche target audience that your product has, and if not, you should be kind of adhering to whatever medium you're designing for, making sure that it's accessible to others. Yeah. All right, Blakey boy, I'm getting out of here. Right. Uh, that's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week and I guess last month and whatever. If you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned for the after show. we got some fun stuff to talk about today. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social media channels at H Factors Podcast. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, here the after show. You can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, newinfectorscast.com. Mr. Blake Armstrong, thanks for hanging out with me on the show. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about Amazon's robots? Oh, you can always talk to me about Amazon's robots and other Amazon things at Don't Panic UX on Twitter. Excellent. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing this week and every week. Thank you, Jeff. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, Blake. It depends. It depends. Sounded really aggressive when I said thank you, Jeff. It's it's a parody. It's thank you, Jeff. Thank you. You've, you've heard it. No.